Mother Earth needs to be treated kind. Father Time, tick tick into remind that each day can be such a gift when we give each other a lift. Welcome to Contributions to Earth. I'm your host, Carolina Presto. And this month, we are featuring Casa Myrna, a nonprofit organization that is dedicated to helping victims of domestic violence and teen violence in dating. Please help me welcome into the studio today, CEO Stephanie Brown and also Deborah Collins Coosby to the show. Ladies, welcome and so happy to have you here today. Thanks Thank you. for having us. Please tell us about this wonderful organization, Casa Myrna, and, and actually how you got involved in it. So Casa Myrna started back in uh, 1977 um, by a group of local community women who were living in the South End who were hearing from other community women uh, about uh, the abuse that they were suffering in their homes. Uh, so this group got together and said, how can we support the women in our community who are being impacted by domestic violence? Uh, and they decided to open a shelter. And that shelter still is in existence today, uh, sheltering families coming in um, to our emergency shelter program. Um, Casa Myrna, Myrna Vasquez um, was actually uh, a member of the group, um, of the original group of women who started the organization. Uh, and Myrna passed away um, before uh, the opening of the shelter program. And so to honor Mim Myrna, um, Myrna's memory, uh, they named the program after her. Now, was she aware that it was happening, that it was being built? Yes, she was. So she oh, passed great. away prior to, right before the opening of the program. And so they just wanted to honor her, her legacy, and her hard work um, on behalf of the community of the South End and named this program Casa Mirna Vasquez. And how did you girls get involved in, in the program? Well, I've been CEO for three months, so oh, I'm very new. Oh, three months. Oh, yes. congratulations. Oh, thank you very much. I'm loving it. Um, although I actually volunteered at Casa Marina on the hotline about 15 years ago, so that was my first introduction. I had moved to Boston and really wanted to do something to help women and to, to work to end domestic violence and sexual assault, and volunteered at Casa Marina. Um, so now I'm back, <laughs> and I love it, and I think there's a definite need for Casa Marina, and so I'm thrilled to be here. Oh, that's wonderful. Yeah, yeah. And Deb, how'd you get involved? I started out 23 years ago. Wow. Um, in this work and initially coming out of college I had a degree in journalism and worked for about two years and realized I just wasn't happy I just thought I had a, another purpose um, and thought how can I use my skills um, to do something that I really would want to you know really want to do and that's working with women and children um, and I started out by doing community outreach and education and awareness work um, and that was 23 years ago um, and still Thank going you. strong yeah wonderful and so if a man or a woman, because we want to want to note that it's not just um, women that this mm -hmm. happens to; it's also men and children mm -hmm. um, that have this violent. Uh, they have to deal with this violence in the home or wherever it takes place, and we'll get into all those different places um, later on mm -hmm. and how to find out what those are. Um, how do they get in touch with you, and, and how does that process work? I think usually the the best and the fastest way for people to get in touch with us is through our hot is through our hotline. Um, we off, we operate the state's domestic violence hotline. It's called SafeLink, um, and people can call us and they can get information. They can get access to services. Uh, we can give them uh, connections to resources across the state, uh, and that's really a good place for people to start. Um, and not just for not just survivors either, but uh, family members, friends, people who want to help, who might have questions about domestic violence, mm -hmm. professionals. Uh, anybody can call us and we will help them in any way we possibly can. Wonderful. Mm -hmm. And the hotline number, if anybody wants it, is 1-877-785-2020. And it's 24-7, uh, multilingual, so people can, we can respond in any language people speak, um, and free and confidential. Other forms of support that you offer be to these women besides the shelter and the safety and the education, such as a, a legal action? Yes, we're very fortunate that we have three full-time attorneys uh, who work with our residential community, um, our residential clients, but also our community-based clients as well. So is there someone out there who needs support around seeking a divorce, around child support, spousal support? They can, too, call our hotline and be transferred over to our um, community, uh, I'm sorry, our legal advocacy services and speak with one of our full-time attorneys. So people have to know that they can get counseling and it's free Absolutely. so they don't have to feel like they have to stay there mm -hmm. because they don't have the money to all of our services are happen. free 
all of our services are free and, mm -hmm. and that should never be a barrier for seeking services. So we have free counseling support, we have um, free housing and search, housing assistance and search support, free economic literacy uh, support as well. And we also have advocates that are placed in uh, two Boston courts um, in addition to two of the uh, Boston Community Health Centers it's where they could um, go and also seek support through one of our legal, um, I'm sorry, through one of our community advocate specialists. Um, so again, if anybody wanted to make contact, can call the hotline, and the hotline will then direct them to the appropriate person. Well, that's wonderful to know about the um, extended family members and friends, because um, I don't know. It's sad to say, but you know, I think all of us might have a story about someone we know mm -hmm. that's been in that situation, and you just don't know what to do. Absolutely. So I'm just wondering. Um, say they just they just don't know who to call. Do you have handouts at different places? Mm -hmm. How would they yeah. find out about it? Besides, I'm so happy that you're doing the show, but other than the show. Where would they find out about it? So if there is anyone who wants information, they can contact us directly. But we do have our information posted in community health centers, community centers, schools. Um, and so it's someone wanting to call safely, because oftentimes we get callers that call, um, and, it, it, and it could be a, a member of a family, a co-worker, a neighbor, um, and they don't quite know what to do. Um, and they call just for, you know, just to, we engage them in a conversation about what can I do, you know, what can I do to uh, support and is this domestic violence? Oftentimes we get a lot of calls about is this, I'm not quite sure what this is. So we talk mm. it through with them, is this domestic violence? Um, is this something I should be concerned about? And so we sit down and we talk with them and we, we, we talk with people about not being judgmental. And so if you're trying to, to support someone, it's always very important that you not do it in a judgmental way. Because if that person that you're trying to support feels judged, they may, they may then not come back and seek support from you. Um, and so we talk about how to have the conversation. We talk about uh, safety options. We talk about, you know, just, a, you know, if two friends sitting down and having a conversation, how can you do that safely? What, what happens if she doesn't, he or she doesn't want to hear what I have to say? Then you just, you need to just let that person know that you're there. Um, you, can, you may not be ready to talk about it right now. But when you're ready, know that I'm here and I'm willing to listen and I want to be supportive. And so we get those calls as well. We, sometimes we get calls from organizations or companies that may have, a, may have had an issue with some, um, a worker um, experiencing domestic violence where the abuser showed up on the job. Oh. Um, and so we talk about safety planning and we talk about coming out and doing an awareness or um, a domestic violence one-on-one -on -one talk and what does that mean for an employer to be prepared and, and to ready to hear that advice and then support um, the colleague or the worker. And so the hotline can help folks sort through these things. So it's, it's there for the victim and the caller, but it's also there to support that community that may be experiencing this situation as well. And I, I wanted to bring um, this to point that it's not just when, when you think of domestic violence, you think of black eye, blood, you mm -hmm. know, these awful photos which are just awful, mm -hmm. terrible thing to look at. But there's also different kinds of abuse, and I'd like to, you know, talk about that today because a lot of people think, oh, well, he didn't hit me, or my coworker was mean to me, but he he or she said something that was out of place, but oh, they didn't hurt me, physically hurt mm -hmm. me. So there's a thin line there, and um, people need to know that this is still unacceptable and it's a form of abuse. Mm -hmm. So can we talk a little bit about that and what the guidelines are for that? Sure. I mean, I think domestic violence is a pattern of controlling behavior, you know, trying to control someone, someone else's behavior. Um, and it isn't always physical. Um, and so it could be, you know, mental abuse, um, emotional abuse, uh, making someone think that they don't deserve anything better, um, mm -hmm. you know, really disrupting their self-confidence, um, making them feel like they deserve whatever it is they get. Uh, financial abuse, that's huge. You think with, you know, the with the cost of housing and being able to support yourself in Boston or across Massachusetts, if you don't have access to your checkbook or you're worried that your job may in, be in jeopardy because your abuser comes to the comes to the office, mm -hmm. um, then those are very very real um, forms of abuse. And you know, I've had a number of battered women tell me, women who've been abused, tell me that they would rather have the the bruises because then at least there's proof that there's something there and that something's happened to them. Oh but when it's over time, emotional and and mental and psychological, then that that seriously takes its toll on people. It certainly mm -hmm. does. Mm -hmm. And not only that, but these people have to function. They have to get up, right. take care of their children if they have children. Yep. Man, a man or a, a woman, mm -hmm. depending on who the person is that's being abused, and then go work and be happy. How do right. you be happy and pretend that nothing, you go outside and put on a happy face, and then you go back and you're miserable again? Right. Mm -hmm. 
how, how does that work? Right. What's the average um, length of time that one, is it all different levels of time I would imagine, but do you finding now that women are more aware of it and they get help faster? Or men, whoever the um, victim is? I think it's, a, it's, it's about the individual um, that's coming through. So we've had people who have come through recently who had the first incident, they were out the door, I'm leaving. I'm done. We had a woman come in uh, just last week, ac actually, into our emergency shelter program, who was uh, 79 years old. Oh goodness! And she had been abused for over 50 years by her husband, um, and she had, it was just something that she decided that you know I'm going to leave, and she got she made a call to SafeLink, um, and we had space. Um, in our emergency shelter Wonderful. program, and we were able to shelter her. So it is really about the, the it's an individual, um, so we have people, you know, on average it takes about someone, it takes about seven times for someone to decide I'm leaving and I'm done. So you may attempt to leave and go back, leave and go back, and that's about seven times of going back and forth before that seven, you know, that last and final time when you're saying this is it, I'm absolutely out. But we never judge. If you want to go back, that's okay. Let us give you some information where you can at least try to be safer in your situation. Because we have to, all, we have to remember, people in abusive relationships don't want their relationships to end. They want the abuse to end. And sometimes that's hard for people to understand. Because it's not abuse happening all the time. Right. Well, so there, there are good times. Mm -hmm. And particularly when you have kids, and it's great that you mentioned that, Carolina, because oftentimes children are the unseen victims in all of this. Children are as equally, if not more, impacted by the violence that they witness and live with on a daily basis, whether that's they're, they're, they're acting out in school. Sometimes we do a lot of outreach to schools um, because we have oh, kids who great. are acting out in school that can't sit still. You have kids who are coming in and they're sleepy. You have kids that are coming in and they're hungry. And it's not necessarily, some, it's not necessarily the fault of mom. Um, it may be that child is living in an abusive household where he or she can't sleep at night because so much is going on. It may be that somebody is controlling the amount of food that gets eaten, if any at all. Wow. It may be that the homework's not getting done because it's not an environment conducive to doing homework. And so we educate the schools and teachers about those things too. So let's not just assume that it's something else when it could be this. You know, the, there's the victim and then sometimes the abuser can be a victim too of whatever happened to them. Mm -hmm. And there's that, that trickle down effect. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, let's ask that question. Do the abusers get help too? We don't provide help personally at Casa Marina, but if we have um, someone coming in who wants to keep their family intact, Maybe they're seeking coming through our, some of our community supports, or maybe they, they may even be in our shelter, one of our shelter programs. If, if the goal is that they want to reunite and be a con, an intact family, then we can refer, um, t refer the abuser to other programs, batterers intervention programs, counseling programs, if that's the goal. Um, but we often say that's the work that that person has to do. You are not responsible or have any control over what the abuser may or may not choose to do. So that's great as a goal, but know that you still need to do the pieces of the work that you need to do for yourself. And, and so the most important thing, of course, would be to just safely remove whoever it is that has to be safe out of the household. And let's talk a little bit about that now. If someone's in a real crisis, um, they you know have to have, have the police there, whatever, can they call you and just someone come and get them right away, or how does that work? So what happens when a caller calls um, and they've made the des decision to leave, um, they call our hotline, the SafeLink hotline, and we're, SafeLink has the most up-to-date um, bed update system where they're able to tell where there is space in shelters across the state. Oftentimes, unfortunately, there is not, a, there's no space. It's just the space is, the, co the amount of people needing shelter far exceeds what's available. So then our, our advocates on the hotline have to get think of other options and present that to the caller. Is there a family member that you can go to and be safe with? Is there, um, you know, a friend uh, that you can go and be safe there? Oftentimes it's, we, you know, if there's space in a surround, a shelter in a surrounding state, sometimes that can be the option too, where we can send, you know, refer them to one of those shelter programs out of state. Um, but it's just, and sometimes it's, um, there is nowhere to go. So it's, if a person says, I have no options, then how can we then keep you as safe as we possibly can in your situation, in your home? And then we safety plan with them about what that looks like. What does safety planning look like in my home, at my workplace, at my children's school? Um, those sort of things. And so, 
you know, we just we have to get us creative. Sometimes we're we're calling shelter programs and we're begging people, can you just put somebody on a couch? This is a high risk case. There are no options. Um, and so our advocates spend a lot of time just doing some of that work because oftentimes, like I said, there is no space available uh, for people to go when they're ready to leave. Wow. And so. I, I mean, I would add too that you know most survivors want to stay in their community and stay in their home. Um, and oftentimes, survivors make the decision that it's safer for them to stay and not to flee because they know how lethal their their abuser could be. Um, sometimes it makes more economic sense for them to stay because if the options are between you know homelessness and shelter for them and their children or to remain, then sometimes it makes more sense for them to stay. Um, so I think that we also have to make sure that people understand that women don't necessarily stay in an abusive situation because they are afraid to take action because it's better for them and their families mm -hmm. um, and they know you know they know the abuse the best and they know uh, their bet their abuser the best mm -hmm. um, and so we have to we have to um, you know take their lead and know that they understand it best um, and so I think that that's mm -hmm. you know important to note as well that you know fleeing yeah. isn't an option for everybody so we have the the husband or the wife then we have the children and then we have the in between the teenagers mm -hmm. and now there's the teen violence, dating violence. What, what's going on with that and how do you help the kids that are involved in that to recognize the signs of teen violence? Um, I know that it's in schools now and trying to make um, people aware of what's going on. So what do you folks do over there to help that? We talk a lot about, because sometimes domestic violence is a, is a big word for teens to kind of take in and understand. And they'll say, you know, we're not married, we're not this. And so we talk a really a lot, we talk a lot about healthy, relationships. What does a healthy relationship look like? So if you have, you're in a relationship with a boyfriend um, and your boyfriend is constantly texting you, uh, wanting to know every step you make, that's not a healthy relationship. Um, if you're being isolated from your friends, or you're not able to hang out or go to the mall, and um, that's not a healthy relationship. So we do a lot of healthy relationship work with our teens um, that come in. We have um, one of our shelter programs is a teen a, a teen living program. It's a program designed for te teen moms who are pregnant and parenting, um, and so it's just a lot of a lot of talk of healthy relationships, whether that's with a boyfriend or a friend. What does that look like in this day and age? Technology. We have uh, we have huge conversations now about technology that we weren't having ten years ago, not even five years ago, because the technology is 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 uh, changing so rapidly. And so we talk about what does that look like. Once something is put out there for the world, it stays out there for the world to see. Um, and so to be mindful of that um, as well. And so we we do a lot of you know just just a lot of talk about social media and and. Um, Again, what a healthy relationship looks like, um, and 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 so that we also want them to know that, um, again, just like we do with our adults, you're not alone in this situation. If there is, if you for whatever reason can't talk to your parent, that should be your first option. But if you can't, please find a safe and trusting adult to talk to, to to, to support you through this, and that you know to have that person reach out. Um, there isn't, unfortunately, there isn't a hotline in Massachusetts right now um, that will for teen dating violence. Um, mm -hmm. One doesn't exist, um, but there is a national hotline. So oftentimes we get callers that are calling our hotline, where well, we may refer them to the national teen dating hotline um, as well, um, so that they can get the support um, that they need um, that is anonymous and confidential. And I think I think it's very important that people do take teen dating violence very seriously because it can be just as dangerous, just just as abusive as an adult relationship. Just as deadly. Right, right. Mm -hmm. And I think people discount, oh, it's teens, it's puppy love, you know, how bad could it be? They don't live together. Mm -hmm. um, but it can be just mm -hmm. as dangerous. All right, so on a silver lining note, let's talk about some of the success stories. We often we remind people that this is not a destination. Like you're not, you know, it's a journey. And it's a long, hard road. It's not easy. It's just leaving your situation and moving into shelter, um, and then having to um, kind of leave. You may have to leave a life behind if you're in a if you're dealing with a very abusive person. Um, but it is it is it's a journey and a process. And oftentimes you may feel as though you're taking two steps forward, and you may fall back. But that's okay. We we I see Castle Mountain as a place where you can safely fall and somebody will be there to support you and, and keep, keep
keep you lifted. Um, and so people, women and women come in, the majority of the folks that we see are women. Um, they come in and um, they use this as an opportunity to redesign their lives. We say that all the time. Mm -hmm. if, if there's, a, if we don't often get an opportunity to do that. So here you have an opportunity to redesign your life. You can be and do whatever it is that you want to do. You can go and live wherever it is you want to live. Take this opportunity while you're here to do those things. If you decide you you know you want to start a career and do something different, um, this is a place where you can begin to take those steps to do to do that work. Um, so people come in, they come through our emergency shelter program. Um, they can stay there for up to six months. Um, they can move over to a transitional living program, which gives them a longer length of stay to continue to work on the goals that they may have started in the emergency shelter program. Um, and then hopefully within those 18, 18 months, they find permanent affordable housing. Um, and then they go off and they do. We've had, we have wonderful success stories. We've had people who come to us, because Casa has been in existence for so long now, people who came to us as children, huh? who came with their moms, who are now adults and living very successful lives. Um, so we know that it, it, it you know, changed, certainly positive change. We measure success in small ways. When you get to us, sometimes just getting out of bed and getting those kids to school, that's success for today. Right. That, Opening up a checking account yeah. when you weren't in charge of the money before. Yeah. How about liking yourself? Yeah, right. liking right. yourself. Yeah. Getting a haircut. Exactly. Being you handed deserve a, it. Being handed a yep. gift card to a local right. store and say, you can go out and buy what you want to buy. Right. That's a success. Yeah. So we so measure it very differently. You're learning yeah. skills all over again because you've broken down yeah. so much yeah. in mm -hmm. an abusive situation. The self-esteem is gone. Absolutely not. And you're kind of zombieish right. going mm -hmm. through the functions of life, getting right. through, putting on a happy face when you leave, the world. and then dealing with yeah. all the craziness mm -hmm. when you get back. Right. So you know it takes its toll, and fortunately, the training that you give folks will help them regain their self-esteem. Mm -hmm. Do they have programs to help them with the schools? Yes, so we have programs that will help not only mom, but we have we have, we have a family advocate that will work with, and advocates that will work with getting the kids enrolled in school, getting the kids enrolled in daycare, getting the kids whatever services they may need in addition, because we have to remember kids are the unseen, so a lot's going on in, in their little lives. We shelter 35 kids a day, every night. Really? We shelter 35 children. We really do have to do some reprogramming in with them. We, we, you know, we have people come in and that are work with them, homework assistants. We, sometimes we come in because moms haven't had an opportunity to learn how to play with their children because the, the, the situation has been so controlled that our advocates are on the floor playing with the kids and the mom and showing mom how to play. They haven't had to discipline. So we've had to, so some of it, we, we're having to relearn some, some of the old bad behaviors um, and, and, and replace that with good positive ones. Um, but it, sometimes it's just as simple as, as that, having mom sit down and read a book with the children. That's because you haven't had an opportunity. Not that you weren't willing to do that. It's just that you just, somebody was controlling that situation and you weren't allowed to do that. So sometimes moms come in and they're not bonded with their children and we have to sort of start that process over. Um, again for them and work with them to do that so and it's hard it is hard it's not an easy like I said it's not an easy road but they stick with it and, and they're consistent they're in survival mode mm -hmm. so it's Absolutely. hard for them to act like mothers yeah. or sisters or whatever mm -hmm. wives you know because they just are in survival mode Absolutely. which doesn't allow them to feel those emotions right. and maybe have learned the, the skills to be a mm -hmm. parent because they're always defending themselves but the wonderful thing about your program too is that um, it's just that people can know that they can start their life over, mm -hmm. that it's not the rest of their lives, that abuse is not acceptable mm -hmm. on right. any level, at work, at school, yep. from a stranger, from your husband, from your wife, from anybody that you meet at all. Right. It's just totally unacceptable. Mm -hmm. right. and, and, um, and to learn the skills and the words to say to people or not say, or just walk away when people are behaving that way. Right, mm -hmm. right. And I think, I mean, I think that's what you said is incredibly important because I think that all of us have a, have a part to play in ending domestic violence. And one of those key parts is telling people that it's not acceptable. And so supporting survivors and telling them that they're not alone, telling survivors that no one should be doing this to them. Uh, you know, setting an example for men and for abusers that this is not acceptable behavior. Um, and so, you know, telling people, telling survivors that you're with them and that they're not alone and you support them and you'll help them mm -hmm. and respect their decisions, mm -hmm. I think that's critical. I'm sure there's lots of people that want to get involved to help you. So how would they go about doing that? 
We love it when people get involved because we can't do this by ourselves. So people can give us financial contributions. Um, we certainly welcome that. Um, people can uh, provide us with household items. Uh, you know, we have hundreds of families moving throughout uh, our shelter system uh, every year, and so we can certainly use household mm -hmm. items, and there's a list of them on our website. Uh, we can use volunteers, so if people have skills they'd like to bring to I'll us, sign up. <laughs> we'd love to have you. They have skills they'd love to bring us, uh, professional services, marketing, public relations, web design, all of that we can certainly use. Um, and every spring, we have a community of conscious breakfast. Uh, so we're always looking for sponsors and people to come join us at that event. Lovely. Yes. Stephanie, I want to thank you so much for coming into the studio today. And Deborah, thank you as you. well. You do wonderful things. And um, because of you, the world's a better place. We want to educate uh, people across the country and New England about domestic violence. And we appreciate all you, you're doing for, for those folks who need you. Um, we just want to reach out to those at home. We want to let you know that this is absolutely unacceptable. So please hang in there and be brave and strong. And know there's always help out there if you need it. If you'd like to reach Casa Mata Hotline, it's 877-785-2020. That's 877-785-2020. Don't be afraid to call. Use the number if you need it. Our website is casamata.org. It's all about you. It's all about me. It's all about living together in harmony. We celebrate life for all it's worth. It's all about contributions, contributions to earth.